Hi, I'm Bennett Chiron. This is my talk on directional DBS as delivered at the North American Neuromodulation Society meeting in Las Vegas 2018. I divided this talk into three parts. First, we address why. Uh, why has uh, segmented leads of non-circumferential electrode um, got so much attention recently? To answer the question of why directional DBS a bit better, we have to understand that DBS programming is effectively field restriction. What we do when we program a DBS lead is that we try and spread electric current into the bits of the brain that we, we would like it to spread to for therapeutic benefit, and we keep it from spreading to the bits of the brain that produce side effects. We tend to do this in a, a fairly standardized fashion, where there be some small variations from center to center, but overall, we tend to follow a pattern based on increasing complexity. So we tend to start with monopolar stimulation, and if that doesn't work, we do a bit of field restriction by uh, finding a suitable bipolar stimulation montage. And if that doesn't work, we try to subselect the activated neural elements by varying things like pulse width and frequency. If that doesn't work, and as a last resort, we do complex field shaping using technologies such as interleaving and multiple independent current control systems. To understand this a little bit better, if you imagine a lead aimed at target X and you do monopolar stimulation or bipolar montage, you produce fairly regular electric fields, spherical or ovoid electric fields. Now, if that doesn't do uh, enough in terms of therapeutic benefit, you might want to produce a complex field shape or a compound field shape, because effectively these are produced by compounding the simpler field shapes. And we do this through two technologies. One is fractionation of these fields in time, which, which is uh, similar to Medtronic's interleaving protocol. So you have two different programs running uh, alternately at a very high frequency, 125 hertz, and that effectively produces that complex field shape that you desire. The second and newer technology is multiple ind independent current controllers. So you have multiple current controllers, so you can have completely different programs on two separate contacts, fractionating current between those two contacts to produce the, a similar field shape. The advantage being that because you're not time fractionating, frequency is opened up as an extra parameter when you use multiple independent current controllers. However, all of these technologies share one common weakness, which is that they're actually symmetrical. In the long axis of the lead, the fields produced are symmetrical to the left and to the right. So if you want to spread current to the left, you also have to spread current to the right of that lead. If you want to pull, it, pull in current anteriorly, you also have to pull in current posteriorly. Directional DBS is different because directional DBS is actually asymmetrical. With a directional DBS system, if you activate a single segmented contact, you produce an electric field that is no longer symmetrical around the long axis of the lead. To understand why that's important, we've modeled the volume of tissue activation for therapy, uh, at therapeutic current strength and the volume of tissue activation at the side effect threshold for one patient uh, in our case series uh, report uh, uh, published recently. So the volume of tissue activated at therapeutic current strength is in the teal blue color and the volume of tissue activated at side effect threshold is in yellow. The space between the outer margin of the uh, blue spheroid and the outer margin of the yellow spheroid is actually a spatial representation of our therapeutic window. For the same patient, a single contact at the same level, 10B, was found to be uh, the most effective uh, segmented contact. And here again we've modeled the volume of tissue activation at therapeutic current strength and side effect threshold. You'll note here, firstly, that the 
um, VTA is produced are axially asymmetrical. But you also note that as a consequence of that, you can continue to spread current in this figure to the right without much consequence, resulting in that large increase in the yellow uh, uh, cross section. This is the breathing room that directional DBS can produce. There are two other points that you'll note here. One, the therapeutic current strength for uh, omnidirectional stimulation, non-directional stimulation, is 1.2 milliamps, but for the therapeutic current strength for directional stimulation is just 0.75 milliamps. The second thing you'll note is that the volume of tissue activation produced And the side effect threshold is much, much larger for directional DBS. Understanding these small differences is crucial to uh, uh, getting the most out of directional DBS systems. So again, in our uh, case series, we've modeled how much laterality directional DBS can produce. So if you imagine uh, that uh, a DBS lead is divided into two hemiplanes, Omnidirectional stimulation produces a volume of tissue activation that is equal in both hemiplanes. So it's 50-50 in each hemiplane, so there's no laterality. Directional stimulation through a single uh, segment produces an, a high degree of laterality at low current strengths that slowly falls as you increase the current strength because current leaks towards the opposite hemifield. The other uh, key point to understand is the size of the VTA. To understand this a bit better, I've taken a VTA model that, uh, from uh, another poster that we've done where we've modeled directional and omnidirectional stimulation through, uh, at the same level, at the same amplitude. This is at 1.5 milliamps. Here you'll note that omnidirectional stimulation in red is much smaller than directional st stimulation at the same current strength through a single segmented contact. In fact, it's about 35% larger in this uh, VTA model. And this is because when you dial up 1.5 milliamps through a single segment, you produce a high current density, which translates into a higher rapidly vol varying voltage distribution in tissue, which is more effective at neural activation. When you dial up 1.5 milliamps to three segments, omnidirectional stimulation, you divide this up into 0.5 milliamps per segment, producing a much weaker current density, much weaker voltage distribution in tissue, and smaller neural tissue activation. So to answer the question, why directional DBS? It's because it opens up a new and unique way of restricting field that is quite effective and can be quite efficient. It's effective because for the first time it's actually asymmetrical and it's efficient because you can produce a similar volume of tissue activation with less current. Which leads nicely on to how to get the most out of directional DBS. A common misconception about directional DBS is that if you activate omnidirectionally, say at 3 milliamps, you produce a large field of uh, tissue activation. And if you switch off two contacts, focusing the field onto a single segmented contact, you produce a smaller focus field uh, tissue activation. We now know that this is not true. This is because we now know that activating three segments, omnidirectional stimulation, at any given current strength, say 2 milliamps, produces, produces a smaller volume of tissue activation than activating just two, set, two of those segments, uh, and much smaller volume of tissue activation than acting, activating a single segment at a time. This means that to study a single segment at the same resolution as you would study three segments, you need to increase amplitude 
in, uh, in smaller steps while you're screening these segmented electrodes. Secondly, you need, you need to anticipate benefits at a lower amplitude in the best direction and in the best level. You may see an unfamiliarly low number, say 0.75 milliamps, uh, and it is comfortable to, to leave stimulation uh, at a number that you're more familiar with, say 2 milliamps. But you need to anticipate that these benefits may occur earlier in these smaller segmented contacts because they can be more efficient at activating uh, neural tissue and because you're spending the power in the right place. Rule two is to prioritize single segment activation. So you remember this graph, uh, which shows the volume of tissue activation in, uh, in hemiplanes, two hemiplanes, one on, um, along the long axis of the lead. So for omnidirectional stimulation in blue, the left-hand panel, there is no laterality. 50% of the volume of tissue activated is, on, is in one hemifield, and 50% is in the other. With activating a single segment, you get a high degree of laterality to start with, which falls as you increase current strength. But the surprise will come when you examine what happens with two segments. When you activate two segments, you activate most of the circumference of the lead, and as you increase uh, current strength, uh, the electric field leaks into, uh, in, uh, further into the opposite hemifield, and you get very little laterality indeed. So to maximize directional field restriction, you activate one segment at a time. When you want to steer current between two segments, when you want to fractionate currents between two segments, you do sacrifice these, this increased laterality or this increased asymmetry that directional uh, DBS can produce. Rule three is to be ruthlessly reductive. When you have four electrodes, you have 24 possible electrode montage permutations. When you have eight electrodes, you have eight factorial of 40,320 electrode per, uh, montage permutations. So to get through the workload, you need to be ruthlessly reductive. Uh, by which we mean that once you find uh, uh, a few contacts with a good therapeutic window, if the third contact along uh, does not produce anywhere near that level of benefit, um, you can abandon testing that contact and move on. You have to follow a systematic approach to screening. It doesn't matter what the system is, as long as you follow a system. Uh, the figure on the right shows uh, the graphical documentation scheme that we've, we, we've used and that we've published both in our paper and in a poster, the links below. You may need to adapt your screening method. Again, we've written on this uh, in our paper. Uh, we, we tend to, uh, for one, document the uh, side effect very consistently. The, the, the red line on these graphs is very consistent as the first sustained side effect, no matter how mild. You may need to adapt your screening schedule. Uh, a screening schedule that works for a lot of people is to uh, screen omnidirectionally at the first visit, leave the best omnidirectional contact switched on, bring the patient back in a week or two, and then screen at that best omnidirectional level, uh, screen those three segments at the second screening visit. Finally, now that we've covered why and how, uh, we'll look at some early outcomes that people are reporting. I'm going to report my own experience when I was uh, the academic neurologist at Oxford, but also we'll cover the published outcomes from other centers. So we've reported on eight patients with BIM thalamic DBS with the Infinity DBS lead system, which has 1.5 millimeter spacing. We evaluated patients at 45 days postoperatively with the detailed monopolar review scheme uh, the, and graphical programming scheme that I've mentioned previously. Our key finding was a gain in therapeutic window. We defined therapeutic window as the difference between current strength at which desired clinical outcome is achieved and that at which first 
the first sustained side effect, no matter how minor, is reported. Directional DBS in our study produced an, a significant improvement in therapeutic window. And this is quite similar to what people have reported before. Uh, Polo and others reported as early as 2001 in an intraoperative safety study that um, in the best direction, uh, there was a significant, significant improvement in therapeutic window. Dembeck et al. more recently uh, have reported a similar finding uh, in, in, in a post-operative study. The second key outcome in our study is lower therapy current strength, which is to say that directional stimulation requires less power, less uh, therapy current strength to produce the same level of benefit as omnidirectional stimulation. This has previously been reported by Polo and others, in, uh, and they were the first to report this. We now know why. It's partly a mixture of spending the energy in the right place, which is what directional stimulation can do, but also it can be more efficient at producing the same size of VTA. Uh, but Dembeck and others have, did not reproduce this particular finding. And the answer may be in step size rule one of directional programming. If you use a large step size, such as one milliamp, you're unlikely to uh, obtain this reduction in therapy current strength. The third outcome that we want to note is that directional programming features are widely utilized. So when we analyzed it by lead, um, we had 15 leads studied in eight patients in our study. Uh, Nine of those leads were programmed directionally. When you look at it by patient, however, that means that seven out of eight patients use directional stimulation features on at least one side. This was surprising to us, uh, and when we first started presenting this data, I think there was considerable surprise, but more recently, Dembeck uh, has also reported similar findings at six months, which is to say that 14 out of 20 leads were programmed directionally at six months which means that eight out of 10 patients use directional stimulation features on at least one side. The last outcome is that the, the benefits of directional stimulation appear to be persistent. You do spend a little bit more time up front programming these leads, but the benefit appears to be uh, stability. So these are uh, outcome uh, measures in, in tremor score and disability um, at three months and six months, and they're identical uh, without any changes in program settings. This is similar to what Dembeck and others have reported. They also reported six month outcomes showing significant reduction in dopaminergic medication and a good uh, response to DBS at six months. In summary, these are early experiences with directional DBS and they're encouraging. Larger cohorts and long-term data is required to show that these gains can be, one, widely reproduced, and two, translate into better long-term outcomes for these patients. Two, the key challenge right now with direction DBS is programming time and complexity, and innovations that reduce programming time and complexity will be key to the uptake of directional programming features. Three, we need to guard against lowering of surgical standards. It's true that directional DBS opens up larger therapeutic windows and therefore could possibly prevent uh, uh, the, the need for uh, lead revisions in a few patients, but only at the expense of therapeutic window. For in this early stage uh, of directional DBS adoption, it's important to involve patients in the decision-making process Explain all the options, demo the implants, demo the patient controllers. Explain that directional DBS systems can also deliver non-directional DBS. And for those questioning whether they should wait for the next generation of sensing IPGs, remember that directional leads are likely uh, to underpin those sensing IPGs.